Welcome, everybody. I'm just so pleased that we have this uh, teaching this afternoon. And uh, let's see, I think there are enough seats, so, but if you, anybody wants to come forward or come more toward the center, please, please feel free to do so at this point. My name is Michael Reich. I'm a professor of economics here at Cal, and I'm also the director of the Institute for Research on Labor and Employment. And uh, yeah, the Institute is an organized research unit here at Berkeley. It's been around since 1945. We're devoted uh, to employment and workplace issues. Uh, in fact, for the last 67 years, we have been the leading research institute in California devoted to workplace labor and employment issues. We provide cutting edge uh, research, education, and outreach programs that inform public policies. And as our chancellor said recently, it shows what we do show that we can do more to build an America that works for everyone. The Institute includes affiliated faculty members from over a dozen academic disciplines and professional schools. And uh, we have research centers that serve an important bridge between the university uh, policymakers and the general public. If this is your first interaction with us, we hope you'll join us uh, through our, get on our email list, check our research and uh, our website. What you're seeing now is a slideshow that is on our, our site. Our website is www.irle or early.berkeley.edu and we have a library also in our building on Channing Way which is open to everyone. We're proud to host this event in collaboration or really with the leadership of the Center for Labor Research and Education, also known as the Berkeley Labor Center. And we thank our co-sponsors, uh, the Department of Geography, the Academic Student Employees Union, which is UAW 2865, the Berkeley Journal of Employment and Labor Law, Amnesty International, I see I have some uh, competition, <laughs> <laughs> and the ASUC Office of the External Affairs Vice President. Uh, the Labor Center, by the way, is our largest program. It conducts groundbreaking research on work and employment issues, particularly on such uh, topics as low-wage jobs, health care, labor in the green economy, and on the global economy. And for those of you who are students here, uh, it sponsors student internships, paid student internships in the summer uh, that you should know about. Uh, we have numerous outreach programs that come out of our Labor Center. We're privileged to have today with us both stellar faculty members, I would say super stellar, superstar faculty members from the, from the campus who, are, can, who uh, have been conducting some of the foundational research on income inequality, and we have stellar practitioners from outside the university who were working to address these issues in the field. This is the kind of thing that our institute and our labor center does so well. Uh, I'd also like to note that it's April 4th today, uh, and in 1968, on April 4th, which is 40, uh, some 44 years ago, if I'm counting correctly, Martin Luther King was fighting for social and economic justice in Memphis, Tennessee at a sanitation worker strike uh, when he was assassinated. The workers um, um, and students of Memphis continued what was uh, today we would call their Occupy movement and ultimately won that strike after his death. I remember the day personally quite vividly. I was a young graduate student at the time, and although I was already a multi-year civil rights veteran, I remember redoubling uh, my thoughts on that day that we, you know, I wanted to contribute intellectually to the fight for economic and social justice. And so I think we are honoring Dr. King similarly today in our discussions uh, here. So again, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm now going to introduce uh, Dr. Carol Zabin, who's the research director of the Berkeley Labor Center. She's going to moderate the first panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, welcome, everybody. Happy spring. Somebody told me it's going to be the 99% spring. Um, and so in our academic tradition of a great university at, uh, that is Cal Berkeley, we're going to start off our first panel with a discussion of the state of the world, the state of the United States anyway, in terms of income inequality, uh, its current nature, its causes, its consequences. Uh, and then the second panel is going to be what can we do about it. 
So I'm going to introduce our, our um, very distinguished speakers. And because we don't have chairs up here, I think they're going to sit there until it is their turn. Um, the first one is Emmanuel Saez, who's uh, E. Morris Cox Professor of Economics and Director of the Center for Equitable Growth here at Cal. He is one of the most uh, nationally known scholars on the issue of uh, inequality and tax policy. He received his PhD from uh, MIT in economics in 1999. He's been awarded numerous uh, awards and honors, uh, most recently a MacArthur Fellowship in 2010. I think what I'll do is introduce all of you and then call you up. Um, our next speaker is Silvia Allegretto, uh, another labor economist and deputy chair of the Center on Wage and Employment Dynamics at UC Berkeley. She received her PhD in economics from the University of Colorado. She worked for many years at the Economic Policy Institute, EPI, and is still associated with that uh, institution. She co-authored several editions of The State of Working America, and last year authored The State of Working America's Wealth. Uh, she is called upon by the media uh, very, very frequently um, to provide commentary and to give us context about the um, economic data and trends that we read about. And finally, our last speaker is Paul Pearson. He's the John Gross Professor of Political Science here at Cal. His teaching and research includes uh, politics and public policy. His recent book is called Winner Take All Politics, How Washington Made the Rich Richer and Turned Its Back on the Middle, on the Middle Class. Enough said there. It was co-authored by Jacob ha Hacker. Um, and he also is an active commenta commentator on public affairs, um, has written for the New York Times Magazine, the Washington Post, and the New Republic. So the ground rules are that they'll each have 15 minutes to give their presentation. We will then uh, open it up for questions. Um, in this part of the, uh, the session today, we're really going to limit it to questions as opposed to comments. We'd like to give preference to UC Berkeley students. We welcome, of course, the Berkeley community as well. But we always like to make sure that um, students get a chance to ask questions. And um, we ask that everybody ask just one question. I'm a tough timekeeper, and I will cut you off if you um, ask, go, go into the commenting as opposed to the questions. Um, OK, so let me turn it over to Dr. Saez. All right. Thank you uh, uh, very much all for uh, coming and uh, uh, for organizing this uh, session. So today I will talk about uh, the income gap, evidence, and uh, tax policy uh, implications. So this is, if you will, a, a summary of uh, uh, many studies I and, and co-authors have been doing uh, over the years. So let me start with uh, the evidence. So this chart uh, depicts the share of total income going to the top 10% uh, in the United States over uh, almost uh, a century. So this comes from uh, data we compiled with my uh, co-author uh, Thomas Piketty. So what you can see uh, on that chart is that uh, income concentration was high in the first part of the 20th century with the top 10% income earners earning about 45% of total income. Then it fell precipitously during World War II. And in the decades following World War II, you had a much lower level of uh, income concentration down to uh, the low 30s. However, what is most striking on that chart is that since the late 1970s, the share of total income going to the top 10% has increased uh, dramatically. So that in recent years, 2010, here is the latest year, uh, we are back to a level of income concentration uh, as high as it was before uh, World War II. The second uh, striking fact about that uh, increase in income concentration is how concentrated uh, the change has been. And so you can see that in that second chart that breaks uh, the top 10% into three groups. Uh, in black, you have the top 1%, then uh, in blue, the next 4%, and in red, the next 
5%. Uh, uh, and so what is striking here is that if you look at the recent period, you see that most of the increase, uh, really, you know, uh, over 80% of the increase in the top 10% share is really coming from a dramatic increase in the top 1% income share, from less than 10% in the late 70s to uh, about 20% uh, today. The groups just below the top 1% have increased, but really uh, by very small amounts relative to the top uh, 1%. So why does this uh, matter, that the rich uh, are getting richer? It matters first because uh, the changes have been so enormous that they really dramatically affect uh, our uh, evaluation or uh, the sense we get about uh, macroeconomic growth. So just to illustrate this, if you look at the recent period, 1993 to 2010, Average real income growth per family has been 14%, which over a 17-year period is actually a pretty small, modest growth. However, the top 1% increased by uh, 58%, so that when you remove the top 1% and you focus only on the bottom uh, 99%, the growth of per family, pre-tax per family uh, income was only 6.4%, so less than half uh, of uh, the growth uh, of the average. So that's why when you hear about macroeconomic growth, you hear about overall average growth. But you can see that the experience for the vast uh, majority, here we are talking about the bottom 99%, is uh, sharply different because uh, uh, of this increase in uh, income uh, concentration. So uh, further down this table, I, I break down uh, the growth in various uh, periods. So let me uh, just say uh, this, that uh, the Great Recession uh, hit dramatically incomes. Of course, you know, the top 1% were hit particularly hard because of the, of, of the collapse in uh, 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 stock prices, but the bottom 99% lost 12% in real income during the Great Recession, which is something that had not been seen uh, since the Great Depression uh, in the United States. And so what is uh, perhaps most worrisome in that table is that for the last year, that is 2009 to 2010, the when income started increasing uh, again in that first year, actually, uh, pretty much uh, all the growth was captured by the top 1%. That in, th th their incomes increased over 11%, while the bottom 99% basically saw uh, zero uh, uh, gains uh, in real terms. So let me now uh, start talking uh, about taxes. So the evidence I've shown you is that pre-tax uh, top U.S. incomes have surged uh, in recent decades, from less, the top 1% capturing less than 10% of incomes in the 70s to over 20% uh, today. So that means that uh, there is now a lot uh, of income. That is, there is potentially there a fiscal reserve at the top of the distribution. So just to, to, to put numbers in perspectives, currently the top 1% income earners pay an average uh, federal individual tax rate of 23%. Uh, if you were to double uh, that tax rate from 23 to 46 uh, Percent And 46%, I mean, it's obviously a, a high number, but it's something that uh, the U.S. has experienced uh, in past decades, uh, in the middle of the 20th uh, century, or s that some European countries uh, are doing. You would actually raise uh, 3% of GDP if you do the static calculation, that is, assuming that uh, there is no behavioral response to the tax change. So this is an enormous amount. This is $450 billion uh, per year or six trillion as uh, over the next decade as it is projected uh, in a, a, a standard uh, budget uh, projection. So that means that, so six trillion dollars is more than uh, repealing uh, all the Bush uh, tax cuts. So, so the bottom line I, I, I want to make here is that the top 1% definitely now has a large uh, potential capacity. But the key question we have to ask as economists, would higher uh, top tax rate uh, affect uh, the economy? And so uh, 
so that's a question uh, I and many co-authors uh, have studied. So let me uh, uh, summarize it as follows. First, there is definitely strong evidence uh, that pre-tax top incomes are affected uh, by, by top tax rates. I'll show you uh, charts uh, you know, depicting that, that, that evidence. However, just from that fact, uh, it's not enough uh, to conclude whether or not it's a good thing to increase uh, top tax rates. So there are three potential scenarios that have very different uh, policy consequences. The first one is the supply side scenario, whereby top earners work less and earn less uh, when their taxes uh, increase. Under that scenario, top tax rates should not be uh, too high, because top tax rates are detrimental to uh, economic uh, activity. The second scenario is a tax avoidance or evasion uh, scenario, whereby top earners uh, avoid or evade more when taxes uh, increase. So if that scenario uh, uh, is the reality, uh, the policy consequence is very different. Because here, under that scenario, what you should do is uh, eliminate uh, loopholes, that is, tax avoidance uh, opportunities that exist uh, in the current uh, uh, tax systems. And so there are a number of examples of countries successfully uh, eliminating uh, uh, tax avoidance opportunities. And then once those uh, tax avoidance opportunities have been eliminated, then it becomes possible to increase uh, top tax rates productively, so, to, so as to raise a significant uh, scenario. And let me uh, put here a third uh, scenario whereby that, that I call the rent seeking uh, scenario, where top earners uh, extract more pay at the expense of the 99% when uh, top tax rates uh, are low. So it's the uh, idea that high top tax rates uh, prevent, I, I mean, weaken the bargaining position, if you will, of the uh, top earners and uh, uh, puts uh, a lead on uh, top compensation. And under that scenario, uh, high top tax rates are actually desirable because they keep in check income inequality and they redistribute uh, uh, resources uh, towards the bottom 99%. Uh, uh, so let me uh, show you some evidence to uh, discuss which scenario uh, is the most uh, plausible. So here uh, is a, a chart showing you for a large number of uh, uh, OECD countries uh, the, top, the link between the top marginal tax rate and the top one income share in the country in the late 70s. So what you can see here is that in the late 70s, top 1% income shares are uniformly relatively low. That is, all countries except you know, Germany are below 10%. Uh, and tax rates are pretty widely distributed, with the US having a top tax rate over 70%, you know, being on the, uh, having a much higher tax rates, for example, than uh, France uh, at that time. And so what is striking is that when you look at the same chart for uh, recent years, you see a dramatic shift uh, this way, that is, countries, all countries have eliminated uh, their very high tax rates, and top income shares have indeed moved uh, further up, with the most extreme case, you know, being uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, here. But you can see that today there is actually a, a striking alignment uh, between uh, how high the top tax rate is and how much top incomes get before taxes. Okay, so this is the top income share before uh, taxes. So there is no mechanical uh, 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 link between the two charts. And indeed, when you look at the difference, you, you look at the change in the top marginal tax rates from the 70s to the present and the increase in the top 1% income share, there is a clear correlation between the two. That is, countries which didn't change their top tax rates, didn't experience a change uh, uh, in uh, income concentration, while the countries who did cut significantly did experience a surge uh, in uh, their uh, 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 top income. So this is, uh, I think, strong evidence that uh, there are uh, behavioral responses now. 
do those behavioral responses, you know, is, is this coming, you know, from extra work, extra growth from the top 1% or is this coming, you know, that surge in top incomes at the expense of the 99%? So let me, it's, it's a hard question uh, to answer, but let me show you uh, very basic evidence uh, on this chart here uh, that shows, uh, again, you know, the same countries by how much they cut their top tax rates, you know, from the 70s to the present. Correl and, and uh, looking at their uh, GDP per capita real annual growth, that is their, uh, ec their economic growth uh, success uh, during that period. And so it's a scatter uh, cloud. And what is striking here is that you don't see actually any strong uh, 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 correlation. So it's not the case that the countries here, like uh, the US uh, or the UK, that have cut their top tax rates uh, very significantly have experienced uh, 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 more growth than countries, say, like Germany, uh, 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 who uh, haven't. So that evidence seems uh, consistent with uh, 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 more consistent with the rent-seeking scenario than the traditional uh, supply-side uh, scenario. So le let me uh, come back uh, to uh, the United States uh, to finish. You know the time series uh, in the United States that shows you uh, incomes for the top one percent in black. You know, so that's here on this scale by how much they have grown. You know, if you have an index, you know, starting at 100 in 1913, uh, and in diamonds, empty diamonds, uh, the bottom, 99%. Uh, and in red here, I have the top tax rate on uh, that scale. And so, uh, what is really striking uh, in that graph is that in periods where the top tax rate is very high, like it was, you know, from the New Deal to uh, 1980. Uh, uh, That's a period where top 1% incomes uh, increase actually very slowly. And in contrast, that's a period where bottom 99% income increase uh, very fast. And when tax rates, top tax rates come down very significantly, you know, following the Reagan uh, administration tax cuts, and that's still the case today, uh, we see the exact uh, inverse pattern, namely the top 1% explode and uh, the bottom 99% grow uh, much more uh, modestly. Okay, so this, of course, you know, it's just uh, time series evidence, but again, you know, it shows you that the, the evidence here again seems more consistent with a scenario where you have rent seeking, that is at a time, you know, where taxes are high, it's hard for the top incomes to bargain, you know, for significant pay, and it's, easy, and it's easier, you know, for bottom uh, incomes uh, to increase, and the reverse happens uh, in uh, when the top taxes uh, 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 come uh, down. And another important fact that uh, is visible in that graph and that should not be forgotten is that there have been periods uh, in the United States where you had extremely high top tax rates. You can see here, you know, tax rates are in excess of uh, 70%, and yet there was good uh, economic growth for the vast majority. You know, that was a period where the U.S. economy was growing and where that growth uh, was definitely benefiting uh, the bottom 99%. Uh, uh, so to uh, conclude, uh, U.S. historical evidence and international evidence shows that tax policy plays a key role in shaping uh, the income gap. High top tax rates reduce the pre-tax income gap without necessarily uh, hurting uh, uh, economic growth. If anything, you know, the evidence goes uh, the other way. Obviously, in the globalized world uh, we are in today, uh, successful progressive uh, taxation likely will require uh, international coordination, but a country as large as the United States uh, could definitely uh, uh, play a central role. And um, in the end, the US public will favor more progressive taxation probably only if the public is really convinced uh, that top incomes are unfairly earned and, you know, to the detriment uh, of the 99%. That is, I think that piece of evidence uh, 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 is central uh, uh, to convince the public that tax policy needs to be uh, uh, reformed in a, uh, in a very significant uh, way.
Hello. Um, thanks for being here. I would like to thank all the sponsors, especially the Labor Center, uh, Ken Jacobs and his crew, uh, um, uh, Rebecca Graham, somewhere around here, who was very, very helpful. Uh, I know spring break is just over, and your heads are probably uh, a little bit fuzzy, you know, from all that swimming at the beaches. And so, uh, but I uh, want to talk uh, about some data, and I, I use Professor Professor Saez's data all the time, um, but also kind of um, interweave that with, uh, you know, the folklore of the American dream. Uh, the, these ideals, these tenets of the American dream are, are woven very tightly into the fabric of our lives. So I think it's very important to question, um, uh, as my uh, good friend Bruce Springsteen has recently, uh, not really good friends, but uh, <laughs> I wish, but um, really kind of trying to take stock with what is what is the American dream? What is the ideal of the dream? And how uh, measuring the distance between that dream and the reality, which is exactly what we're doing by looking over these long-term trends of data. So one of the first tenets, certainly, that we, we think, and again, this is just kind of loosely held ideals. Nobody has the same, uh, you know, the same uh, tenets of the American dream in their mind. I think for the first people, the immigrants, it was to get here and to kind of, so one generation, your children would do better than what, what you have done. But certainly, um, this idea of having, you know, a lot of people in the U.S., probably less so over the last few years than before, having this notion of great wealth, that anybody coming from anywhere under any circumstances can work hard and attain great wealth. Um, and of course, that's just not true. We see, um, we see this in a lot of the data. One study, for instance, that, father, that, that followed a generation of children who were born into the bottom fifth of the bottom quintile of family income, followed them over a generation to see where they were. And uh, after that, about 43% of them were still in the bottom quintile as working adults. And only about 6% of them made it to the top. So we definitely have some movement. Some people do strike it rich, there's no doubt about it. But we have much less mobility in the US than uh, you might think. Of course, for a lot of students here at the University of California at Berkeley, this great institution, this is what your ladder probably looks like. It looks pretty bright, it looks pretty straightforward. You're starting pretty high on the ladder. Of course, that briefcase there is full of a bunch of IOUs of student <laughs> loans that, that make, might make it a little bit harder to get there. But of course, um, you know, this is the case for you know people who are who get to go to college. That certainly gives people you know, gives one a leg up. Um, but of course, it, it, the latter isn't the same for everyone, and it's certainly not the same over countries. We know that um, I think people are always shocked by this. This is um, one. Um, measure of intergenerational, this is the intergenerational elasticity of earnings for my um, econ friends, quant heads, but basically all it's saying is the longer the bar, the more correlation between a, where a son ends up, or what a son ends up earning compared to what his father was earning. So there's less mobi mobility the longer these bars are. And people are always kind of shocked that um, even just up north in Canada there's a lot more mobility than there is here uh, in the U.S. Of course, one reason for that is that the, um, the latter in the U.S. is different than in a lot of these countries. It's much longer. The, uh, there's a lot of people dangling off the bottom here in the U.S., and the, the, those at the top of the U.S., the latter is way, way up there in the stratosphere. Um, so uh, basically, we have, uh, if you want to be really rich, you probably want to be in the U.S. If you're not doing so well, you might want to be in one of these other countries that have better safety nets. So that brings me more to more recent data, though. What has happened since the Great Recession? And basically, I, I see that there's a lot of people who thought they had a firm footing on the uh, middle class rung of the economic ladder. And they have been sliding and slipping and falling off, mostly due to the wealth that they have lost in the housing market, which is the most, most um, folks and typical people have, uh, in, typical families in the US, most of their wealth is tied up in their houses. And that has certainly has not um, turned itself around as of yet. And also that, a lot of people lost their jobs and their incomes. 
and even those who have kept their incomes, um, they have really not been going anywhere. Um, so this is, uh, this really makes you wonder uh, about the, the second tenet, which is um, the meritocracy. I mean, how can it be that people who played by the rules, people who went to school, people who worked very hard, people who owned their own homes, people who thought that they had had it made just a few years ago, are now struggling to keep their heads and their houses above water? Um, it just is a real indictment on the fact that we don't have the system based on merit that a lot of people think we do in the US. It's just not quite as strong as uh, we might like it to be. And of course, for you students who are studying here, I'm sure you've studied all types of things. I think Santorum said something about this university the other day and all you lefties out here, um, you know, studying those things like race and class and gender. But I'm sure that you've seen uh, that it does matter you know, race, class, gender does matter. So let me give you just um, one, you know, just one, uh, one, one chart that kind of shows this. This is simply uh, a, a chart of it, its percentage of completing college. So these are all low score individuals. These first three bars are all low scoring individuals. These were uh, on an eighth grade math test and, and how these um, individuals, um, whether they completed college or not. And so the different colored of bars are whether they come from a low income, a middle income, or a high income household. So the first thing you see is that from the high, the high income household, even though they all scored low on the math test, did, was, had a greater probability of actually graduating from college. And what you see is this actually holds this kind of stepwise uh, for low, middle, middle, and high income families uh, up the scale of scores. Um, and I think the big takeaway here really is that if you have uh, um, a very a, a, a wealthy kid who scores low on tests, the probability of the college receiving a college degree is the same as a really smart kid who comes from a low income household. So again, this speaks against this idea that we have uh, the meritocracy uh, to the degree that uh, many here uh, think that we do. So class matters, where you start matters. We have uh, what EPI calls inequality at the starting gate, which is why we don't really want equal outcomes in the US, but we do want people to have equal opportunities. So, this brings me more to kind of a wider angle lens, the big picture of what has happened to workers over a long period of time. And what this shows, very importantly, is from 1947 to around the early 70s, you had productivity and average hourly wage and compensation that includes things like health care increasing at an equal clip. And that was really good for the economy. As the economy was expanding, businesses were becoming more profitable, productivity was increasing, and part of that um, increase in productivity was shared between the companies, between firms, and between workers. And that's how we get real gains, gains in uh, the real, um, real um, standards of living. This is one way that we, we think that that, that, that that happens. We have to have that kind of uh, coupled uh, you know, indices of uh, productivity and, uh, and, and wages. But of course, that has completely broken down. And you have to ask yourself, well, I mean, what is it? Why since the 1950s are corporate profits now uh, record-breaking at an all-time high? Well, the share going to wages of GDP is at an all-time low. I mean, did that just happen? Is this, um, is this uh, you know, a, a natural outcome of the free market? And you know, that's another um, tenet, or uh, it seems to be, especially now with the, the, the political atmospheres going on, a lot of talk about the free market, the free market, market-based solutions, market-based solutions, and then a lot of screaming about socialism on the other side. But the fact is that we have a mixed market. We've always had a mixed market. Uh, we have a lot of good markets that are um, capitalist, and they are free markets, and they run very efficiently. And we also have some markets that we try to run in the free market system, like healthcare, which isn't very amenable to such a market. And we have the system of uh, a socialized system where we have unemployment insurance, because we as the wealthiest nation in the world think that we should take care of people who uh, are down through no far their own through something like unemployment insurance or food stamps. 
Medicare, Medicaid. I mean, it's just silly to always be arguing something like the free market and anything else is socialism. And uh, you can call it what you want, but we've always had these mixed markets, which I don't think gets talked about, talked about enough. So, but why this increase in inequality that we've just seen from Professor Saez? I mean, those who have benefited want us to believe that it's fair, it's just, and it's a natural outcome of the free market system. They want us to believe that. That's why I think there's always this rhetoric of socialism in the background, humming in the background every time anybody questions the free market system. So this is um, not an outcome of the free market system. This is certainly an outcome of something like supply side economics. And uh, Ken and I were just talking, you know, they're doubling down again. I mean, look at the uh, Ryan budget, doubling down on supply side economics. But of course, we're way beyond the doubling down. We're at a much bigger number after 30 years of this. And this big experiment has proven uh, what the outcomes of the continuation of it and the ratcheting up of it, it would mean, that the rich people are going to get rich. And Americans don't begrudge wealth. I think we love that we have rich people in this country. We love that we have the opportunity, and maybe if we're lucky enough, we can become wealthy. But when the wealthy are taking, as we just saw, 90-some percent, 95, 96 percent of the expansion, the economy that expanded in 2009, 2010, they grabbed all of those gains, the top 1 percent, while the rest of us are falling further and further behind. That says to me that the wealthy are becoming more wealthy at the expense of the rest of us. So, it, you know, a rising tide lifting all boats, we all think that's great. And that also means that there's very wealthy people. But that's not what's happening. It, the, the amount of wealth that we have now is definitely um, working against our economy and working against, I think, a healthy democracy. So this is just um, this is a picture of wages, what I call wage inequality, uh, and, and the continuation of it in California. And this is saying over a long period of time, these wages are indexed to 1979, and saying at all the different percentiles, how are people that are in those percentiles today doing compared to workers that were in those percentiles in 1979? And really, everybody under the 60th percentile and below are doing about the same or worse than workers in those percentiles back in 1979. And again, I put this so you can kind of see the widening wedge that we see at the top. And if I could break this out even further, um, like we did with the other day that we've just seen, the top 1% or the top 0.1%, it would look even worse. Um, it would look, uh, be much wider. Um, so again, I think it's, you know, this is, um, this is a good reason why we have to question our system and our, our ideals. And, um, I would just like to point out here that the only time that we had the rising tide lifting all boats was in the tight labor markets of the late 1990s. We see here increases at all levels, from the bottom through the middle through the top. And that is the second Fed ma mandate. The Fed has a dual mandate of price stability and full employment, but we rarely have full employment. And with, uh, without full employment, our workers can't get anywhere, especially with what has happened to, to uh, the union situation in our country. So, of course, one of the things that really cracks me up is that the powers that be, the people who have benefited from this system, many of them run for political offices. As they're running for political offices and they're, uh, they're telling us at the same time, government is evil. Government is not your friend. Government cannot be part of the solution as they know the game is played in government. They're all, they, they vie for uh, positions in government. They um, lobby folks at government, where the financial industry spent something like a half a billion dollars just last year trying to lobby for against the financial reform. They know the way the game is played. And with a straight face, they tell us not to play it. And so this is uh, what happens. I think we know that this vicious cycle has been in effect for the last 30 years or so, and it's been ratcheting up as of late. They know the way the game's played. And as long as they make us you know, believe in this free market ideal and everybody gets what they deserve, and this is natural extensions, they know that they can keep ratcheting it up. And every time we try to do something for the good of the people, it's called socialism and deemed wrong. But for instance, there was no free market God that just came down from on high and said that we need to uh, have this trajectory of top marginal tax rates. 
Well, now it could be that you know uh, maybe it came through some signal from Ayn Rand or something up there. But you know this is policy. This is policy that has been bought and sold time after time through a long period of time uh, by the people who want these policies that make them richer and then make them more powerful. And um, again, this is not some natural outcome of the free market. And I wish that uh, we would talk more and more about that, uh, about that. So, you know, of course, when it got to the banks, uh, when it got to the banks, they needed to be bailed out. Well, that wasn't the free market, was it? That wasn't the free market then. That had to be done. It was a crisis. We had to, we had to let that go. So the Dow was down to about 7,000. Now it's over 13,000. CEO pay is back to, to being normal. Wall Street is buzzing. Profits are back. Uh, and we see as the economy expanding, even at the slow pace that it's expanding, they're taking all the goods. But when it came to Main Street, they decided, game over. They pivoted towards the deficit. That we didn't have to worry about jobs, which that means everything to people on Main Street, their jobs. So let me just leave you with this. This is simply job loss during recessions. So when it, we go into recession like the blue line, that is simply showing how much, and this was the worst recession in 1981 that we ever had since the Great Depression. We lost about 2.5% of all jobs. We uh, uh, we lost, it took us 47 months to recoup those jobs, or 27 months to recoup those jobs. In the 2001 recession, for instance, we lost uh, just 2.5% of all jobs. But this is just to give you a comparison of the worst time before this happened where we were. That was in this, this blue line. This is, this is the USA, the United States today, and those stars tell you when the official recession were over. And to see that if the federal government needs to have aid to the states, this is where California is today. And the US is down, not just this, this five, five million jobs. We need 10 to 12 million jobs just to get back to where we were in 2007, four years ago when this started. We completely abandoned this recovery when it came to Main Street. And this is going to haunt us for a long, long time to come. It's going to be very hard to turn around any type of bad trends that have been happening when you have a labor market such as that, this. So I'll leave you with um, uh, the uh, a quote from George Carlin. And this is great. If you go to YouTube, you can see him rant and raving on this. And I, I definitely uh, I would tell you to do so. But I think it's an imperative. And I think it's patriotic, patriarchal. It's a patriotic if we question this system we question it over and over again until, and, and participate in it until we can mold this mixed system, this mixed free market and socialist type based system. So we have uh, a, an, a system that is more equitable in the long run for us all. Thank you. Paul Pearson is a professor of political science here at Cal Berkeley and uh, right, author of the Winner Take All Politics, How Washington Made the Rich Richer and Turned it, Its Back on the Middle Class. Thank you, uh, and thanks to the organizers, and, and thank you, Sylvia, because I think it probably would have taken me about five minutes to get that slideshow up, give them. Right, right, so I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, so, we're supposed to talk about the uh, causes and consequences of inequality. Uh, and uh, it's a big, complicated uh, subject. Uh, it's one that fortunately is finally starting to get uh, the, kind of, uh, the kind of attention that I think it deserves given the kinds of profound changes that have been taking place in American society over the last 30 years. Uh, but as people start to talk about it more, uh, especially given the quality of uh, discourse, media discourse in the U.S., uh, often what you get is um, more heat than light, uh, and you have uh, many people who are participating in those discussions who I think can fairly be called professional dissemblers, uh, whose goal is to throw as much fog, uh, if you can throw fog, uh, put as much fog over the conversation as they can. Uh, and so what I want to do in the first uh, part of my remarks is just to draw um, a, single, a, a simple analytic distinction 
uh, which I think is helpful, conceptual distinction, that, help, that is helpful in, help, in getting us going and sorting out both the causes of rising inequality and the consequences of rising inequality. And the distinction I want to make is between two different kinds of income inequality or two different ways in which income inequality can grow. All right. uh, and the first, I'm in search of a good, the first type of rising inequality, and I'm in search of a good label for this. If anybody has one, I'd love one, because in the meantime, I'm going to use the pithy label type one inequality, uh, <laughs> is, uh, it can, can, be, can be outlined just by reviewing um, some of the imagery that Sylvia just used. You know, imagine you've got a ladder, right, that, that act, in this case is not the climb to the top, but it's just a, a way of describing the income distribution in a country. And now imagine that the, you just stretch that ladder out so the rungs are getting further and further apart from each other, all right? Um, and uh, that would be a kind of rising inequality, right? The 80th percentile is pulling away from the 20th percentile, the 90th percentile is pulling away from the 10th percentile, uh, and so on. Uh, and there has been some growth of that type one inequality in the United States, right? There, there, has, there is a, a, a general stretching out of the income distribution. Now, many conservatives today, if they want to talk about income inequality at all, they want to convince you that what, what has happened to the United States is basically this type one increase in income inequality, right? That the rungs in the ladder have stretched out. Uh, and the reason that they want to focus on that is because it allows them to provide two different narratives that are comfortable for them, that are non-threatening to them, maybe even politically advantageous to them. The first narrative is a narrative that says this is all about globalization and changes in technology. Right? That's why you have rising inequality. And you can see the growth of this type one inequality in almost all affluent democracies. That's true. It's actually not true in all of them, but it's true in almost all of them. Right? So they say, this is just, in the words of Henry Paulson, right, former head of Goldman Sachs, who then went on to be uh, Bush's Treasury Secretary, inequality is just an economic reality. And there's no point in blaming any political party for it. Right. So politics is let off the hook. Political parties are let off the hook in this story. It's just globalization. The second narrative it lent, that this type one inequality lends itself to uh, is the one that Charles Murray has offered. Right. We're turning in, we've turned into a meritocracy. People with merit have risen to the top. People without merit, right. people who make bad decisions, don't get themselves educated, don't get married, don't play by the rules, they go to the bottom. Right? So it lends itself to a blame the victim kind of narrative. Right? Now, there are other narratives. There are liberal narratives right? that talk about uh, the declining uh, efforts. You know, I think about like uh, Claudia Golden uh, and Larry Katz's work, which emphasizes that really we do need to continue to improve education to avoid this kind of uh, increase in inequality. But certainly there are these two, which you, and you now hear them more and more, these comfortable uh, conservative narratives it's all about globalization, or it's all about the bad behavior of people at the bottom. That's why inequality has grown. And inequality is mostly just about uh, people with merit or high skills pulling away uh, from people without merit or skills. Right. So here's where you need to realize that there's type two inequality. Right. Type two inequality is that ladder, the very top rung. Right. Here's a slide. Uh, on, on this, and you saw uh, uh, additional slides about this uh, in the previous presentations, the very top rung is shooting out into space, right? uh, leaving all the other rungs behind. Right? I do have a name for this, winner-take-all inequality. Right? The gains are going to the top, uh, and even the top 1% doesn't really, talking about the top 1%, really doesn't capture how uh, intensely concentrated uh, the gains have been. Here's a slide where we take a look uh, at percentage increases inside the top 1%, and you see uh, that the greatest gains by far are going to people in the top 10th of 1%, top 100th of 1%, right? Uh, I, I like 
the core slogan of Occupy Wall Street. Probably couldn't, you know, couldn't have imagined coming up with anything better, I think, as a way of capturing the social reality, except that maybe it should be, we are the 99.9%. <laughs> that would actually be, uh, be a little bit more accurate. I want to just, uh, I, I have to, I, I haven't had a chance to be on a, in a, in a public discussion with uh, Emmanuel Sias before, and I want to, I just have to pause for a second here to realize, just to, to say, that much of the work that is going on that has allowed us to focus on this profoundly important type two uh, inequality has been driven by the work that Professor Saez and Professor Peckety did. Um, and I, I just, you know, we can't, we can't measure directly the impact of research and ideas. I was reminded in thinking about this the other day of the famous line in uh, John Maynard Keynes's general theory in which he talks about the profound influence in the world of some academic scribbler. Um, and uh, I, I really believe we have one of those academic scribblers in the room today. Um, and we really all have a profound debt. Um, so, Yeah, thank you. Um, so type two inequality, right? Type two inequality, not, not so uh, uh, easily fit into the comfortable uh, conservative narratives, right? There has been uh, a, a profound shift towards winner take all outcomes uh, in the American economy, right? And what I wanna suggest in the, uh, and, and so when we think about the causes and consequences of type one inequality, they may be quite different than the causes and consequences of type two inequality. Uh, and I think type two inequality is actually uh, the more, in the long run for American society, is the more important and more alarming development. Right? Uh, and as a political scientist, I have to say, I think it forces us to think about the role of politics. Uh, in two very important ways. The first is that when we try to explain where this type two or winner take all inequality comes from, politics is really important. Politics is really important. Uh, a lot of this is a result of public policy and the previous speaker, Sylvia and, and Emmanuel both pointed to aspects of this. Changes in tax policy, uh, changes in uh, uh, government transfer programs have been quite important. Jacob Hacker and I have tried to outline a lot of these important policy changes in our book. Financial deregulation, profoundly important in shifting incomes uh, towards the, uh, the wealthiest Americans. Changes uh, in systems of corporate governance and executive compensation. In this case, it's mostly a case of what government didn't do. Uh, but executive pay is much, much higher than in the U.S than it is in other, and has become increasingly uh, profligate in the US over the last couple of decades to a degree that is unrivaled in the rest of the capitalist world. You know, you can look at firms of equal size in other market democracies, uh, they don't pay their CEOs the way that Americans pay them. All right. So public policy uh, has mattered um, it, quite profoundly, it's not the only thing that has driven these winner-take-all outcomes, but it has been very, very important uh, in driving these winner-take-all take outcomes. And you can see that, and I, again, some of the slides earlier pointed this out, the shift in income to the top 1% or the top 10th of 1% is much greater in the United States than it is in other affluent democracies. Uh, and the only ones that come even close are the ones that have adopted policy profiles, like in the UK, uh, to some extent Canada, that look like the po policy profiles that you see in the US. So politics uh, is really uh, crucial here. That's the first way in which focusing on these winner-take-all outcomes uh, makes one think about politics, that politics has been an important cause. Right? But the other thing we need to think about is that increases in this type two inequality with more and more rewards going to those at the top of uh, the, the, economic, the income distribution, that also affects politics. Right? It affects American politics. Uh, and you know, one can just take a step back and ask, if we're turning into an economic oligarchy or moving in the direction of an economic, uh, becoming an economic oligarchy, is it really possible to imagine 
that you could have those kinds of profound transformations in the distribution of economic resources uh, and not turn into a political oligarchy as well. And if you look at the trends over the last 30 years, I think it's very clear that our politics has been shifting in a direction that is much, much more oriented around the concerns and the interests of the wealthiest Americans. There are two aspects of that story that Jacob and I try to tell in our book. One is what we call the organizational revolution, which really means the way in which the wealthiest and corporations have become much more organized and influential in American politics at the same time that the most important countervailing power in American politics, that is labor unions, has been an organizational decline. Right? There's been a tremendous shift in the balance of organizational resources and it's had a profound effect on our politics. The second aspect has been the radicalization of the Republican Party. Right, the, the continuous, and you know, every time I think they can't go further to the right, they go further to the right. right? Uh, President Obama said the other days, and I think this was actually quite accurate, Ronald Reagan could not win a Republican <laughs> primary today, right? adopting the kinds of policies that he, that he uh, pursued in the 1980s. Right? Uh, the, the party has been radicalized. Uh, here's a slide. People, people often talk about polarization. Uh, between the political parties as if it's somehow about the Democrats moving to the left and Republicans moving equally to the right. But systematic e examination by political scientists of roll call votes shows that overwhelmingly the growth of polarization is a reflective that each cohort of Republicans coming into Congress is well to the right uh, of, the, of the cohorts uh, that they're replacing. Uh, now, to say that the shift to the right of the Republican Party uh, is, um, is a really, really important part of the story is not to let the Democratic Party off the hook. You know, we argue in our book that uh, on these issues, Republicans wear black hats, Democrats wear gray hats. They're conflicted, they're cross-pressured because of the, the, uh, the shifts in organizational power that have taken place in American society. Uh, but there is a huge and growing difference between the two parties on these issues. A simple way to see that, a concise way to show that is if you take the difference between the policies that the Obama administration would like to continue on health care over the next five to 10 years and contrast them with the proposals of the Ryan, of the Ryan plan that was just uh, the budget that was passed uh, by House Republicans, the difference the difference in the health care outcomes of those policies is something like 40 or 50 million Americans with or without health insurance, depending on which path you take. Right? And that number would continue to grow over time. Right? I mean, just think about that for a minute. You know, the next time somebody tells you there's no difference between the political parties, right? 40 or 50 million people either will have health insurance or won't have health insurance, depending on which path we follow. Right. The Ryan plan, more broadly, uh, is an incredible indication of the way in which the move towards economic oligarchy and increasing inequalities of political power in the United States can feed back into policy in a way that means it's not just type two inequality that's being affected by government policy, it's also type one inequality that's going to be affected by public policy. You know, Grover, I've been following these issues for a long time now. There's this famous line from Grover Norquist, right, who's like the, the anti-tax guru for Republicans, who said he didn't, he just wanted to shrink the size of government by 50%, get it to the size where you could drown it in a bathtub. Uh, and that used to be such kind of a joke, right, because it was so extreme it was impossible to contemplate that something like that could happen, given how well institutionalized the mixed economy and the welfare state were. The Ryan plan is that vision. Right? The Ryan plan is that vision of drowning government in the bathtub. I got to skip over these, unfortunately. 34% cuts in Medicaid by 2022 under that plan. 34% cut in the second most important health care program in the United States. Profoundly crucial for meeting health security needs for many, many middle class as well as lower income Americans. Uh, and that's not even counting 
the fact that the budget would eliminate all the Medicaid expansions uh, that are uh, currently scheduled to go under law uh, under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, huge tax increase decreases. Hard to imagine, again, that they would be not just doubling down, but quadrupling down uh, on uh, high-income uh, tax cuts. Two-thirds of all the massive domestic policy cuts uh, that, are, uh, that are in the Ryan plan uh, would come from programs for low-income groups. Uh, so if you think people in the lower end of the income distribution uh, have been losing out over the last 20 or 30 years, you ain't seen nothing yet, all right, um, if that's the direction in which policy moves, all right. Uh, it's a bleak, potentially a bleak message. Uh, and uh, the message in, in Jacob and my, my book about how politics has been driving this, people often say it's a real, real bummer to read how this story has been going, uh, going on for 30 years and seems to continue to march in this direction. I have a friend who was uh, reading our book at the same time that he was reading um, Cormac McCarthy's The Road, you know, and it, you know, it's just a post-apocalyptic novel of a father desperately trying to keep his son alive. And he said, I couldn't figure out which book was more more depressing, but, but and, I, and I said, no, no, our, our, bo our book is an optimistic book. Um, and it is an optimistic book um, because the pessimists are the ones who say, like Henry Paulson, it's just an economic reality and there's nothing you can do about it. Right? It's just globalization, technological change. No, that's false. Right? It's a political choice. So turning around the politics is obviously a very steep hill to climb. At least people are talking about these issues now, and at least they are going to be presented with stark choices during the upcoming campaign on this issue. Uh, but the optimistic news is that it's, it is within the control of a political system in which votes, even though, even though voters are challenged, uh, to, uh, to exercise control over this political process. You know, there have been periods in American politics before where it seemed like an economic oligarchy had permanently uh, placed itself uh, in control of government policy, uh, and the political system has pushed back. Uh, that's the challenge that we face today. So thanks, folks, for a incredibly uh, rich panorama of what's going on and in terms of both the economics and the politics of our current situation, which I think uh, gives a really good foundation for the next panel. Um, we are now going to open it up for questions. We are in a social science room really wouldn't be set up like this. So we're just asking our speakers to stand around and um, and we will take questions. And I, I just can't resist asking um, Professor Saez one question um, before I open it up to the audience. And that is, so we, he, your research really debunks the myth that higher tax rates um, will, are impeding our economic growth or can impede it. So what should be the marginal tax rate on that one, uh, on that? richest 1% where we won't see any negative economic impacts. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's always dangerous to, to give precise numbers, but uh, you know, what, what I would want to, to take out of this presentation is that the debate uh, between you know, the Bush top tax rate of 35% versus the Clinton one of 39.6, uh, seems, you know, you know, in that chart is just like a minuscule margin, you have to think broader, you know, and you can think, you know, that the range you can potentially go, you know, should be uh, uh, up to 80% in, in my view. I mean, that should be part uh, of the debate. Great. Can people in the back see and hear without the mic? Okay. I guess they rebelled against me. They didn't want to stand. So we will open it up to questions now. And I hope I wasn't too tough. And, um, but I want to welcome everybody to ask a question. Um, Okay, you in the middle back there in the black shirt. Yeah. Um, all three of you seem to have started in the 1970s. So uh, my question is, what happened in the 70s to change the pattern? 
Uh, uh, that's a, I, I think that's absolutely right, that that's, that that's where it started. And, it, and I, I can just say, say what, uh, what Jacob and I argue about this in, in our book, and it's striking that it happens in the 70s, right, because that's actually uh, before Reagan comes into office. Uh, and I think there are two, um, two pieces of the story. One is there's a pretty deep uh, crisis of the economic system, both in the United States and other countries. Uh, during the 1970s, right? This is the period of stagflation, where you start to get a situation where countries are simultaneously having a hard time generating full employment uh, and um, uh, keeping uh, price stability. Uh, and so there's a kind of crisis in economic policy making, which leads to, on the one hand, a lot of rethinking about uh, some, some policy ideas, but also opens up a lot of political opportunities. And in the United States, what you see is a huge mobilization on the part of business uh, in the middle part of the 1970s, uh, partly because of these economic trends, but partly also because they suffered a lot of, of important political defeats in the late 1960s and early 1970s in the United States. That was sort of the, the high tide of naderism, uh, environmental protection, consumer protection, and so on, even when Nixon was in the White House. Uh, and so by the time Carter is in office, act and actually a lot of the policy changes in the United States, tax cuts in capital gains and other uh, taxes affecting uh, the, the wealthiest Americans, uh, the beginnings of deregulation, all of this starts under Carter uh, in the last couple of years of the Carter administration rather than uh, with Reagan. And at least we, we argue in the book that a lot of that is a, is a product of political mobilization. Anybody else want to add? Well, I, I think at the same time we had this decline in uh, unionization. Uh, part of it is, was a shift in industry, uh, manufacturing, loss of manufacturing, but a lot of that is a decline in just the political strength of the unions due to uh, institutional changes and how the government perceived unions and uh, the fact where, where we get to a point to today where if you want to join a union, it's almost impossible. So I do think a part of the solution here is to um, certainly get unions back on track to help level the playing field with something like uh, easily, you know, certainly starting with the past passage of the Employee Free Choice Act, for, for instance. Um, what, what role do you think, uh, we, we have what some people call a candidate Senate system. Well, all of our resources go into candidates. Um, I've been active with the Democrats, but none of the resources ever go into organizing people and mobilizing people on a local level. Um, how much of a role do you think that plays? Somebody once said that, we don't have a two-party system, we have a no-party system because it's controlled by, you know, interest groups. Um, well, so, I mean, I, I think actually we have strong, we have stronger political parties today than we've had uh, in uh, close to 100 years. By, and by strong, by strong, I mean parties that tend to vote as blocks. Um, and that see themselves as distinct from each other. Right? So uh, there, are, there are ways in which the parties have become stronger in recent years, uh, and th there are ways in which that potentially is a good thing because it, makes, it, it uh, provides for potentially clear choices. I think actually in this campaign, there is gonna be a pretty clear choice that people can see these two parties, you're gonna get different policies uh, depending on uh, which party is chosen. Now the question is, can you, in between elections, bring leverage on those politicians to, say, keep their promises and be responsive to the people who elected them? I think the geo, and that's a place where, where organized interests have a huge advantage, right? And where those, those interests are much stronger on the Republican side uh, than they are on the Democrat side, which I think is partly why you see that, what, what I was calling asymmetric polarization before, where the Republican Party, partly in response to the growing power of business, as well as the Christian right, has really moved in a way that the Democratic Party hasn't. And I think we'll be talking more about this later. Um, the woman in the orange scarf. Yeah. I was just curious about race and gender. Um, speak to that. Uh, what is the situation as well in terms of race and gender? How has that changed over time? And then what do you think the implications of that are? Could you repeat your question? 
Yes, what are the implications of uh, race and gender uh, on income inequality? How is income inequality shaped by race and gender? Manuel or Silvia? So uh, on, on race, uh, uh, black Americans did very well. That is, started catching up at a strong pace uh, during World War II and then uh, after the, the civil rights in the 60s. But that has stanked. Women have continued to, uh, uh, to, to, to catch up. Uh, especially in the top of the distribution. So actually the, the women doing better, especially getting so much better uh, education, that's a force that actually narrows uh, the gap. But it's a force that is small, you know, relative to what is happening of the uh, stretching, you know, of the ladder, especially at the top. But, but if you look um, at the top 1%, the fraction of women, of women uh, in the top 1% earners, you know, on the wage, uh, in the wage distribution has actually kept increasing and is increasing pretty fast uh, uh, in recent years. Um, the woman in the reddish purple scarf. <laughs> Should, anyone who wants to ask a question, put on a scarf. Um, so um, I'm uh, working on an effort right now to build a national organization for equality at Walmart, where I'm going to be working with Walmart and Walmart workers. And this is Walmart's 50-year anniversary. And as I watch all of your presentations, it just seems to be a better, more clear example of the incredible divergence of income inequality. The workers are making less and less money every year. Can you ask, get to your question? Yeah, my question is, like, what do you, for those of us who care about income inequality, what should we be calling on a company like Walmart to do um, to change? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, that's Andrea. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't see and that. And she's doing a wonderful, she actually is doing a campaign called Our Walmart, which is a little bit different than a traditional uh, union drive. And you can get on the internet and see what she's doing. I think it's a, a very smart thing to do. We have to think outside of the box. So a lot of this change you know, has to come from within. It has to come from the workers themselves. Uh, and, and again, uh, through union or at least collective type of action. Uh, because it is true that the Waltons, uh, I can't remember how many, six or seven of them are in the top Six of them in the t in the top Forbes 400, and I forget what they're worth. It's it's an incredibly large amount of money. Uh, so, uh, and it's at a time where, uh, like, they recently started cutting back on uh, the health care for their part-time workers, which they had instituted, I believe, because of worker pressure some time ago, and then, and now has cut you know, uh, reversed their decision on that. So, I think to uh, you know, a lot of this is just going to come from collective organ. Organiza organizations within and, and without and outside of Walmart, and this the spring of the 99 percent, the Occupy, you know, has to be part of this. I'm I, I'm just so thrilled again that this is in the dialogue. It's it's something uh, income inequality. I've spent uh, most of a lot of my time as an economist on and things that we've known for a long, long time and and have uh, and. And really, when I became an economist, I always wondered why people just weren't always talking about this. Like, this was so crazy. Um, so I think that we are on the verge of something big here, but we're just starting out. It's going to take a very long time. But, you know, the first thing you have to know is what, you know, what the lay of the land is, what has happened and, and why, before we can start getting active to on, on, on turn it. You know, the, uh, the other thing I would say about, about this, and I think it applies as it applies to all kinds of organizing that are going on uh, out there, uh, the Occupy movement and so on, is that, um, that all of this needs to operate at multiple levels. Right? I mean, I, I'm a political scientist, and so maybe I'm, I'm biased towards thinking about uh, the place of policy and, and politics in all of this. But I think it's very clear, for example, if one thinks about uh, the prospects for helping workers and bargaining, uh, the rules of the game for organizing have got to be improved. Uh, you know, they've got to be. You know, they've got to become more equitable. Uh, if um, if if you're, there's really going to be 
market progress, right? Individual victories might be one in, you know, in particular localities, uh, but to really shift the kinds of dynamics that we're talking about, there have to be laws uh, that make it, uh, make it more plausible to actually be able to organize people. And so I would say uh, that constantly in pushing on these issues that we need to be thinking about, does it help us highlight the kinds of issues that can change the political dynamics, right? That can make people aware of what's happening and frame it in a way uh, where uh, they will start to respond to arguments different than the kinds of arguments that Sylvia was describing, these you know, precepts about how the market is always, you know, a free market is gonna generate the best uh, outcomes and you know, we always need to protect the job creators, right? That's the big new Randian phrase that has entered American politics in the last few years. Uh, you know, so all of these fights have to be partly organized towards achieving tangible victories on the ground, but also towards helping to change that broader conversation. The man in the maroon sweater. <laughs> Well, there is a huge, there's a huge difference um, in uh, income distribution is not as, is, is, uh, is, I'm sorry. Uh, the difference between the inequality of wealth versus the inequality of incomes. For most people, they live off of their income, their wage and salary income. And so the distribution of incomes, and I showed a little bit of that, you, you do have different wage distributions that are getting worse, and there, there is a wider gap that is ever growing in incomes, and that includes family incomes, for instance. But when you look at wealth, the, um, the, the, the difference in wealth is just vastly greater than in incomes, because most of the wealth for, for wealthy people, only a small share of their overall wealth is, are, you know, is made up of their actual incomes. They get most of their gains from investments and through capital gains, which then they, um, they are afforded basically a flat tax of about 15%. I mean, they're the lucky ones that get the, the flat tax, the very wealthy, on their capital gains. So, um, you know, the on the other side, for the typical American family, most of their wealth is either through their houses or through their wage and salary income. So um, it, it is the, it's definitely the case that um, wealth is, uh, um, there's a much more uh, a huge divide in wealth than, than it, there are in incomes. Would you like to add something? Yes, yeah, so, so, so wealth is uh, much more concentrated than, than income. In terms of trends, it's, it's hard to know because wealth, you, you don't have good measures uh, of wealth. You don't have you know, a wealth tax that allows you to measure precisely uh, uh, wealth concentration. It seems to have increased uh, less than income, but that's probably temporary. That is, as those high incomes accumulate again uh, fortunes, probably wealth uh, concentration is going to increase, and especially if they pass down to the next generation, that is to their uh, uh, kids, you know, large amount of wealth, you will have a new source of uh, inequality, that is where inheritance uh, is likely to, uh, to play uh, a, a bigger role. The woman in the brown sweater, thank you. The top, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so I, I think you know the the international Re evidence. Repeat the question. Uh, yes. So, uh, say more about how the top tax rates will affect uh, top incomes. So, there is clearly a, a relationship. That is, if you increase taxes on the on the on the top a lot, you are going to see a decline even in pre-tax. That is, before tax uh, income concentration. And the debate is: is this a good thing or a bad thing? If uh, the way the economic system works, and that's what the other panelists, you know, have shown evidence of, is that the gains at the top, you know, come in part at the expense uh, of the rest because, uh, you know, when they have more power, they exploit it, you know, to to to, to extract, you know, a bigger uh, share of the economic surplus. Then it is a good thing to uh, uh, to increase top tax rates, even though it's going to uh, uh, decrease uh, uh, top incomes. Professor Reich. Yeah, I, I just want to take the, the 
It has to be. It has to be a question, though, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm not. Uh, rules don't apply to me here. But <laughs> now, I just want to elaborate because I think Professor Say is being a little circumspect here. That the issue is really how is compensation determined at the executive level, and if there is a rent process, that is where people at the top can just extract more rent from the shareholders and the workers, then um, top compensation can go up a lot. And this has been shown by, say, Bepchuk and Free, two Harvard professors, in their book on executive compensation. And if you have low tax rates, there's more incentive to get higher compensation. It's uh, it, on a pre-tax level. And I think that's the mechanism that we're talking about. Whereas when tax rates go up, you don't get so greedy because you're not going to be able to keep most of it anyway. Okay. Okay. We have time for a few more questions. I'm uh, curious oh. about the uh, illusions uh, of the um, uh, you know, America sort of letting the CEOs do this. Because it's, it hasn't just started, it's been going on. So America has been letting the CEOs make 400 times the average worker. So um, this worshiping of the hero seems to be part of this. And, um, and uh, on the other side, have, has there been any work on a uh, national inferiority complex? Where, <laughs> uh, I'm talking about post-World War II Germany, like, boy, did we, boy are we stupid. Uh, I'm talking about the founding father saying, um, uh, we need checks and balances. Even the best and brightest are, are corrupted by power. You know, this, this, this national insecurity didn't hurt uh, post-war Germany, it didn't hurt the U.S., it didn't hit hurt post-war Japan. Uh, is, there, is there any work on how national insecurity certainly doesn't hurt? And, and to, to sort of dramatize the, nas the, the national security we still fear, um, I asked audiences, who agrees with me that the normal healthy human mind is defective? <laughs> okay. A ramp in a I don't know. Uh, well, just on the first point, I, I, I wasn't when I when I was saying that we let this happen. What I as I was slightly cryptic, and what I what I meant was there were big changes in practices having to do with executive compensation that begin uh, in the 70s and then accelerate, uh, especially in the, in the 90s, really, including a big shift towards um, uh, providing a lot of compensation through options that made it possible for people to um, really gain, for executives to game the system in such a way that they got huge payouts uh, that were not based, were, were really not based on performance. Uh, and there was actually an effort to regulate some of those practices, or at least make uh, firms account for them honestly, that was beaten back by organized uh, political opposition. So, uh, so there, was a, there was a sort of conscious political choice made not to intervene in this process. And I, and, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of that had to do with the fact uh, that the folks who favored this shift in compensation practices were very powerful. Uh, and very organized, and most of the rest of us didn't know what was going on, and, it, and it, it, even if we did, did not have much capacity to leverage the political system. Well, and I would just repeat what I said earlier, is the, the people benefiting from this system have tried to convince everyone that it's fair, just, and the natural order of the free market, and to question it is to be called a socialist, and it seems a fair amount of people come crumble under such name calling. <laughs> yeah, actually, and just I just wanted to add one other thing, which is this this rhetoric about job creators, right? Of this sort of like we we're beholden to these folks. That's actually pretty new as as a as a a, a big part of the discourse. It's actually I think very different from the sort of Reaganite discourse about the nature of the economy and its relationship to govern government. The Reaganite uh, discourse was all about how most Americans were productive and there were, you know, there were a few who were sponging, you know, often with racial overtones, right? There were a few who were sponging on the rest of us who were hardworking, right? Now the rhetoric, and I think it's clear, it is another indication of just how radical the shifts on the Republican side have been. Now the rhetoric is, 
that there are a few superhuman job creators. <laughs> and, there, and we have to do everything we can to encourage them, and we should be grateful for any crumbs that they leave on the table for us. That's a, but that, that is recent, that that has become, you know, and, it, and it's telling that in, a, that in a ostensibly democratic political system, uh, that, you know, you know, Reagan's, it's easy to see how Reagan's rhetoric would appeal to a moderate, you know, middle voter, right? The, 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 the rhetoric of Ayn Rand, how that appeals to a moderate voter is a little harder to see. And it's really just kind of silly, right? Because we are the job creators. Consumers are the job creators. Uh, so this idea, if you can keep our wages down and you can keep our incomes falling, that somehow there's going to be a whole bunch of jobs when we can't consume anything, is just, you know, it's just silly rhetoric. Woman in the white sweater. Oh, really fast. Mr. Pearson, when you're talking about um, the unions becoming stronger in the political process in terms of bargaining for higher wages, are you at all worried about the possibility of cost push inflation? Or like, do you just think the Federal Reserve would well, I do, I do think there are, there are issues related to that, and I think that when we talk about the kinds of economic challenges that not just the U.S., but other countries faced in the 1970s, that, that was part of it. Uh, but when I, when I think about the role of organized labor in the American system, I think focusing on wage bargaining is too narrow a way to think about it. I, I, I really thinking about who is able to get the ear of policymakers in Washington. And policy is incredibly complicated, right? And influencing it, especially in the American political system, requires endurance. It requires persistence and organization. And on all the big issues having to do with income distribution that we've been talking about today, you know, unions, whatever criticisms one might have about possible negative effects of unions in particular situations, they've been on the side of middle class economic interests on these issues. They've just become weaker and weaker. So if you think about like tax policy, the people who, have argue, who argued against the Bush tax cuts right, were, was organized labor more than anybody else. They're just not nearly as strong as they used to be. So I think too often people think, that the role of unions in a modern economy and in a modern society is about their ability to bargain for wages, and that is, that is a significant part of the role that they play. But more broadly, they're an organized voice that potentially provides some countervailing power against the kinds of groups that we've been talking about today. And countries with higher levels of income uh, equality than the United States has are all countries that have stronger unions than the U.S. has. Well put. Um, not to mention minimum wage, health care insurance, Medicaid, <laughs> Medicare, all, all the basic protections for middle class families. Um, the other woman in the white sweater. Well, I think the Occupy movement is obviously correct, um, except for the fact that it could be the 99.99% that might be a little bit more uh, descriptive. Um, you know, I don't see that there is just one movement. So I think that, you know, depending on what Occupy you're talking to or listening to, that they have different messages, it seems to me. Um, but the fact that the overall message seems to be this, you know, horrendous degree of um, inequality uh, that has happened, especially over the last 30 years, is, is the correct one. And I think if the more that people learn about some of the, the data and the slides that we put up here today, I think the more that will, you know, more people will get on board. Yeah, look, I, I, I would, I would uh, be very uh, congratulatory about two aspects of the, of the framing uh, of the movement, but then quite critical on a, on a third piece. The two that I think are, are quite strong, one is that we are the 99%, which I think is 
uh, a great way to, to draw people's attention to the kinds of trends that we've been talking about today. The other is by talking about Wall Street and reminding people at a time where it really looked like, you know, it's amazing how short memories are. It looked like people had forgotten, like what, what some of the sources of, uh, you know, the incredible economic challenges that we're facing are. And I think that the movement has done a very good job of drawing attention back to what has happened to the financial sector in the United States and its connections to Washington. Right, so those, those are, are really strong and important messages. Where I would be more critical is that I think, on the whole, the movement is pretty unsophisticated in the way it thinks about how you bring about political change and how you would shift uh, the tenor of public policy. And there, I think, you've got to engage in electoral politics. You've got to make politicians feel like, and this is where they could take some notes from the Tea Party, right? The Tea Party rewards and punishes, and it organizes itself, it rewards and punishes politicians. And it knows that you have to engage, you can't, you can't just say, oh, you know, that's, all that stuff is awful, you know, they're all corrupt. You have to shift their incentives. So they feel like if they're, if they're responsive to what you're trying to do, they're gonna be rewarded, and if they're not responsive, you're gonna be punished. And there, I think, um, I think uh, Occupy Wall Street's got a lot to learn still. I think we're going to, that's a perfect segue for our, uh, to round out this session and begin to talk about solutions. Um, all of these, uh, our panelists are here in your community at Cal, and their work is very accessible, um, as are they, although I'm sure they're extremely busy. Um, so why don't we give them a round of applause? <laughs>